Sit down, gentlemen. And sit still. I've come to order a coffin for the first one of you who makes a move. Have gun, will travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. Good evening, Mr. Paladin. Good evening. Oh, here are the paper, Mr. Paladin. Oh, thanks, hey boy. Uh, uh, excuse me, must go a lady look for me. Lady? What lady? Mm. Well, I should say it is a lady. Oh, very sorry. And you still can. Uh -huh. I couldn't help overhearing your difficulty. I have an opera box if you would care to be my guest. Oh, thank you. But we could not assume on your courtesy. Uh, we? Uh, my husband and I, Senor. Paladin. Oh. Now, of course, the invitation extends to him also. I've been looking for you, my dear. Oh, Miguel. Uh, Senor Paladin, this is my husband, Senor Rojas. Senor. Senor. And Dr. Mayhew. Great pleasure, Mr. Paladin. Dr. Mayhew. Senor Paladin has kindly offered us his box at the opera tonight. There were no more tickets. Very kind. Uh, Dr. Mayhew is, of course, included in my invitation. That's very gracious of you, Mr. Paladin. The invitation is accepted? We accept. On the condition that you join us and be our guest for dinner, Mr. Paladin. Is that not correct, my dear? Quite correct, Mr. Paladin. Until this evening, then, buenos dias. Mr. Paladin? Oh, 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 oh husband, no like you. <laughs> I'm afraid you're right. But then, why should he? No one could be more at home with history than Edward R. Murrow. For more than 20 years now, he's focused his attention on world affairs, broadened his viewpoint with travel, and sharpened his perspective by meeting and getting to know many of the leading statesmen of our time. Five evenings a week on CBS Radio, Edward R. Murrow shares his experience with you. For a clear, concise report on today's important development, join us on most of these same stations when it's time for Edward R. Murrow with the news. A fuller understanding of current events is waiting for you, too, on every lively edition of our World News Roundup. Seven mornings a week on CBS Radio, the World News Roundup takes you to the scene of the news for eyewitness reports by CBS News correspondents. Hear what's happening direct from where it's happening. Get the feeling of the news along with the facts as our World News Roundup comes your way at breakfast time tomorrow. Doctor, oh, oh. Doctor Mayhew, oh. time to wake up. Oh. The performance is over. Oh. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Paladin. Opera is not one of my special likes. Uh, uh, which one was this? The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. Oh, oh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> well, at any rate, Don Miguel's wife seems to have enjoyed it. Doña Maria is a remarkable woman, Doctor. Meant to savor and enjoy beautiful things. And I might comment for your particular benefit, Mr. Paladin, but Don Miguel is a remarkable man. Wait a minute. Huh? Oh, oh, what is it? Someone behind the curtain. What? what? Don Miguel, look out! Don Miguel! Please, Don Maria, Dr. May, you will do all he can. Oh. Paladin, he needs treatment at once. We'll have to get him out of here. Yes, any news? No, I think we are still waiting. I spoke to the police. There'll be no trouble. It was a clear case of self-defense. The man attacked your husband and was shot down. It was lucky Don Miguel was armed. Yes. Is he always armed? Oh, 
so much now. Did you see the man who attacked your husband? Of course I saw him. Did you know him? No. Hmm. The man looked very surprised the way things turned oh, out. Oh, doesn't Dr. Mayhew hurry? Doña Maria, has Don Miguel ever been attacked like this before? Uh, no. Yes, 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 he has. There is no need to lie about it. It's an insane blood feud that has cost many lives already. It was bound to happen. They failed tonight. They will not fail another time. Blood feud? Perhaps I can help? It is not a tragic opera, senor. In this case, death is very rich. That's all how it is. He's resting quietly. You may go to him now, Doña Maria. Uh, Doña Maria. Yes. Give him my card. This is not time for fun. Yes, Donnie. Miss Crawford. Give it to him. Please. See, I will. Well? Uh, the wound itself isn't too serious, but I don't like the look of it. Why, Doctor? What's the problem? There was poison on the knife blade. Nothing familiar. A plant substance of some sort. The question is, will Don Miguel live? Yes. Yeah. For perhaps a week. Dr. Mayhew has told me I'm dying. That is why I sent for you. After I read your card. My wife has told you of a vendetta. Yes. Yes, she did. What do you want? Revenge? No. My task for you is much more personal. I want you to escort my body safely to my home in San Tomasino and deliver it there to my wife. But Doña Maria, isn't she here in San Francisco? I sent her home this morning. I wish to die unobserved. Someone once commented, you were a remarkable man. Do not misconstrue my sentimentality. The vendetta against our family includes the threat of mutilation of the body. In this case, the bestiality is complete. I would prefer that it did not happen to my body. Will you take the job? All right. $1,000? And expenses. We have a bargain. Good. You'll be paid by Maria upon said delivery of my body in San Tomasino. Thank you, Senor Paladin. Well, in San Francisco. What did you say, hey boy? Big robbery in San Francisco. $230,000. Oh, very careless. You read? No, I was reading something else. Don Miguel Rojas, distinguished visitor from Mexico, died last night of knife wounds, suffered last week, and he was attacked by an unidentified assailant while attending the opera. Paladin? Yes? I am Mr. Wilkins. Oh, yes, the mortician. You sent for me. May I be of help to you? You can turn one of your clients over to me, Mr. Wilkins, the late Don Miguel Rojas. Here, this is a letter of authorization. The body is to go into Mexico. 
You need a certificate across the border, sir. I have that from Dr. Maisie. And uh, how do you propose to transport the body? Yes. I've hired a stagecoach, Mr. Wilson. Uh, when would you like to start? As soon as possible. Don Miguel will be ready. Good day, sir. Good day. Oh, how long you be gone, Mr. Paladin? Oh, 12 days, two weeks at the most. Now, why do you look like that? See, dead man. Oh, no good trick carrying dead man. You know, border stations are all alike, Mr. Paladin. Anybody here? You just try to go through without inspection. You'll find out if anybody's here. Where's your destination? San Tomasino. Name? Paladin. My driver is Timmons. Just the two of you? Three. John Miguel. Hey! You can't take a dead body across the border. Yes, I can. There's a statute book. Read Article 8, page 14. You want to inspect the coffin? Open that thing up? No, oh, not me. All right, sir. What's the country like between here and San Tomasino? Well, empty, except for a water hole called Loma Verde. The rest is rattlers and blow dirt. Oh, go on. Section's over. Let's go, Tim. Yeah! Yeah! Hey! the only spot of green we've seen, Miss Paladin. Loma Verde's hardly a paradise. I don't like it. Huh. Can't say I like it much myself, but we won't be here long. At least we can water the horses. The sooner we can move on. Hold it. Why? We have company behind that rock. Huh? You ever saw Los Manos? Bandits. Don't move. Raise your hand, senores. Do what he says. Why not? He's alone, Mr. Paladin. He'll make me start. Yeah. What are we going to do? We can let him kill us here, or we can fight him here. You say the word. Now. <laughs> wise. Very wise after such a foolish thing. Now climb down carefully. Now what? You may bury your friend if you wish. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Seems I know you from somewhere. Quite possibly. If I take off the handkerchief, you might remember where. Don Miguel. Of course. You're not a bad shot for a corpse. Do not make me prove that point again. Best disinfection anywhere kills disease germs on contact. It's Lysol in a new pine scent. Right. Now there's a new pine scented Lysol. Now your home can be pine sweet and Lysol clean with genuine Lysol brand disinfectant. New pine scented Lysol disinfects, deodorizes, deep cleans kitchen, bathroom, nursery, sick room. Keeps things fresh and sweet with no extra work. Pine-scented Lysol helps guard your home. In laboratory tests, Lysol's anti-germ action kept working for seven full days. So try this new pine-scented Lysol. Make your home... Pine, sweet, and Lysol clean. You can still get regular Lysol, too. <laughs> Turn around, please. You're done. And now we can talk like gentlemen. Sure. 
Now, I would like to satisfy my curiosity about that cargo. Open up my coffin. Money. A great deal of it. The shipping payroll robbery. $230,000. You plan well. Dr. Mayhew was in on this? He has been paid off along with Mr. Wilkins, our undertaker. They made my death seem very convincing. But not as convincing as yours will be, Senor Paladin. What are you waiting for? First, you must help me with another burial. The money must be hidden until certain arrangements are made. Replace the lid and come down. I warn you, any false move will shorten your life and will assure you a much more unpleasant death than you now contemplate. Pick up the shovel. Now move. When you staged that attack at the opera, what about the man who was killed? The man was hired to play a part. I changed the ending of his scene. <laughs> no wonder he looks surprised. You cannot play chess without sacrificing pawn. Now, dig. All right. You're in. Miguel. Miguel. Checkmate. carrier come back to the border. Hey, did you deliver that? The coffin's still up there on top. And the corpse is in the coach. Take a look. You see? Just sit where you are, mister, and start cleaning. <laughs> that is the body in the coach. The coffin up here is filled with stolen money. What are you trying to pull, mister? You don't think I'm telling the truth? No. There's an easy way to prove it. Come on up here and open the coffin. All right, I will. Uh, here, come here. Give me a hand. All right. Well, I'll be. What's your name? Farley. Mr. Farley, there's a lady in San Tomasino waiting for the body of her husband, whereupon she will pay me my fee. I need your help. What's this got to do with me? I thought you might want to get credit for the lady's arrest if she's a part of the plan. What about all this money? What would we do with that? The colonel in command of the 3rd Cavalry at Nogales will sign for it and escort it back to San Francisco. All right. We'll turn the money over to him and start back. But how do we know if this lady is guilty or not? Suppose you leave that up to me, Mr. Farley. Surprised to see me? No, but I thought... I that... didn't wish to disturb the servant. You see, my errand is quite personal. Yes, my husband sent word before he... Would you like us to bring the coffin in this way? Very well. Excuse me. All right, Mr. Farley. I don't like this, Paladin. This is Mr. Farley, Doña Maria, Senora Rojas. How do you, ma'am? How do you do? Uh, I will get your money, Senor. Uh, don't you think you should make certain that I have fulfilled my part of the bargain? Yes, you are right. Open the coffin. Farley. That is my husband. I will get your money. What do you think, Father? Not guilty. No woman could be that calm. She thought her husband was alive and then saw him dead. Then you're satisfied she had nothing to do with him? Yeah. All right. Wait for me at the stage, too. Uh, don't be too long.
Where is your man, senor? There is a drink for him in the kitchen. You hid your surprise very well. And your grief. Yes, I can have grief for Miguel. I do not know how he died, but I can never thank you enough for giving me my freedom. My life was too much a nightmare. I can believe you. I saw it in your face. Goodbye, Dona Maria. Wait. Your money. <laughs> no, I'd rather not. Please, senor. It gives me pleasure to pay for my errors. Especially since this is the last payment. Very well. Should you come again to San Francisco, I hope you'll come with me to the opera. Ah, Dr. Mayhew. Oh, I, uh, I got your message, Mr. Paladin, but I'm afraid I can't give you too much time. I'm a very busy man. All of us are. Ah, here comes another busy man. Hey? Mr. Wilkins, the undertaker. My dear Mr. Paladin, what can I do for you? Sit down, first of all. Thank you. Doctor, uh, uh, Wilkins. Well, Paladin, what is it you want? I'd like to order a coffin. A coffin? For whom? For whichever of you gentlemen makes the first move. Well, I... This is a derringer in case identification escapes you. Hey, boy. Mr. Faraday? Get me a policeman. On second thought, get me two policemen. One apiece. Oh, oh, big story in papers. Dr. Mayhew and Mr. Wilkins all in jail. Where they belong, hey, boy. Ah, here we are. Oh, where are we? San Francisco Opera premiere tonight. Hey, boy, I want you to take this over to the opera house and buy me a box. Oh. Now, what's the matter with you? Last time you go to opera, man get killed, money get stolen. Oh, big trouble. You know, learn? <laughs> of course I learn. What would you have me do? No opera, no lady. <laughs> hey, boy, I'm afraid you have a lot to learn. As Gun Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman McDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Ken Kolb and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Lillian Baez, Harry Bartell, Joseph Kearns, Howard Culver, Ralph Moody, and Vic Perrin. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. There are four of you gentlemen, and I have only one bullet left in my derringer, so my choice is very simple. I'll kill the first man who speaks. Have gun, will travel.
starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. Mr. Paladin, Mr. Paladin. Over here, hey boy. Oh, yes, sir. A bank almost closed. Uh, here the money. Oh, one thousand dollars. Good, good. Thank you, hey boy. Bring the saddlebag along, will you? Well, you go? I go. You just come back from going. I go again. Oh, I see. I see. A lovely lady with long blonde hair who lives in sweet is... She's just a bit too purposeful for my taste at the moment. <laughs> uh, in short, hey boy, she is chasing me. Oh, very, very persuasive lady, Mr. Paladin. And less apt to persuade me to marry her if I'm not around. Give me the bag. Oh, yes. Ah, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> it also makes the eye wander, oh, yes. especially a lady's eye. Easy, boy, easy. Oh, <laughs> very pretty lady. Why you not marry her? Well, a woman has to be something besides pretty for me to go that far. Oh, wait. Someday you come across woman who is something beside pretty. Then, then what? Ah, then what indeed, my friend. Uh, hold any messages that come for me. Oh, send message by wire. Where you go? Where I can't be reached. Uh, where that? I don't know, but I'll find it. Come on, boy. Howdy. Hello. Passing through? Well, I haven't made up my mind yet. What's the name of this town? We call her Bluebell. Looking for a job? <laughs> Just a drink. Yeah, they'll give you one in there if you can pay for it. Thank you, Sheriff. <laughs> What'll it be, Hoppergrass? Ah. Uh. Rye, just give me the bottle in the glass. That'll be five dollars. All right. Uh, must have worked up quite a thirst, stranger. <laughs> I'll get you a better brand than the bar bottle. Mm. Anything else? This will do. Yeah, it ought to. You're the one that belongs to that black horse outside? That's right. Nice animal. Uh, would you care for a drink? Uh, no, thanks. But I got a piece of advice for you, stranger. I wouldn't drink any of that. I already have. Why? Get along, Sue. Customer's waiting for you at the ferro. No, just a minute. There's a customer right here at the bar. I said get. See you around, mister. Now, look, I... Oh. Kind of careless, stranger. Yeah. What was in that drink? Whiskey, mister. That's all they sell. Well, all right. I asked you a question. And I'm giving you an answer. Who are you? That's who I am. Remember me? You're in my place. Remember what happened? No way. I slipped enough drugs in your drink to kill a horse. Here, can you sit up? Uh, oh, I felt better. Pretty stupid, mister. Flashing a thick roll of bills. Uh, oh, it's gone. Sure. <laughs> no Barbary Coast trick. How come you fell for it? No excuse. I was careless. Man's always got an excuse for everything. Every one of you is handsome and clever. Been everywhere, broke a hundred hearts. You've all got the same high opinion of yourselves. Well, that's the... Ooh. 
Oh, my ribs. He tried to finish you off with his boots. Who did? Saul Goodfellow. Saul Good. Now I remember. Here, you need this. <laughs> my derringer. Saul needs something else when he searched to... This card, done, will travel. I like the sound of that. Will you kill him? He took a thousand dollars from me, took my gun, my holster, and I suppose my horse went along, too. You suppose right. Will you kill him? <laughs> Would you care? I felt Saul's boot, too. You know, I have a lot to thank you for. You can thank me by letting me go with you. It's the only way I can leave this town. What's your name? Sue Tyler. Sue? You can pack whatever you want. I'll take you as far as Wickenburg. But I'm going to see Mr. Goodfellow before I leave. When I came here this morning, I had a horse, a gun, and a thousand dollars. I intend to leave the same way. You saying somebody stole your money? What's his name? Saul Goodfellow. I just can't go along with that. Just tell me where I can find him. That won't be hard to do. You just called my brother a thief. I'm Jack Goodfellow. Next thing you'll be saying is that Cousin Jim there doctored your drink. Howdy. Or that maybe our Uncle Ed over there has your horse and your saddlebag. Howdy, mister. Seems to be your town. Sort of a family affair, but... Saul! Saul, come here. What? Fella here's making a complaint against you. That's the truth. I'll trouble you for my gun and my money. What are you talking about? That gun in your holster. The money in your pocket. Saul? Ask him why don't he just take him? That's the gun you say I took, mister? That's the gun. I'll tell you what. I'm going to take five bullets out of this here gun, see? Then I'm going to throw them away, like this. Now, I got one shell left in here. And I'm going to kill you with this one bullet if you try to take his gun. So, come on, take it. If you can, mister. Hand it over. <laughs> You'll be dead before you can draw the hammer back. That's so. Where'd you get that? Come on, you you stay back and hold two shots. Now who wants the second one? All right. I'll take my gun. My money. There's only two hundred. I see you each took a share. Drop your gun, fellas. Don't do it. He killed Saul, but we got four guns, and he's only got one bullet left in that derringer. One's better than none. We got him. When I say three, draw. One. If you say two, I'll kill you. Keep counting. I'll kill the next man who speaks. Yeah, it's true. She's going to run us down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. Come on, get boy. All right. Yeah. All right, give me those lines and get down low. Yeah. Thanks. 
You know, for a girl, you drive pretty well. Stop here. Give me your bag. I can carry my hat. <laughs> I've noticed that. Well, let me help you now. By the time they backtrack, it'll be dark. We'll spend the night here. Can I see that Derringer a minute? Here. I'm going to take a bath in the river. Got three years of bluebell to wash out of my skin. And if you so much as look that way, I'll kill you. <laughs> you pull that trigger and you'll show four rifles our hiding place. Come on, give it to me. Come on. Thanks. Um, you have your bath. And, All right. Uh, I'll try to find some supper. Mm. Rabbit smells good. Mm. Ain't you afraid of showing smoke? No. Dry mesquite doesn't smoke. Oh. I help you cook supper. I wash my clothes. They're dry, and I, I got to stay in this blanket. Sit down. Any side of them when you was out catching dinner? No. How come we spend the night here? Seems darkness might be the best time to run for Wickenburg. You know, the moon rises in an hour. It'll be almost as bright as day. So? I want them to tire their horses searching for us tonight. See, ours will be fresh in the morning. We may be able to outrun them, but we sure can't outfight them with one bullet. Ain't got no other reason in mind for us staying here? No. Where do you go after Wickenburg? Back to San Francisco. Paladin. Hmm. Do you have a wife or anything? No. Take me with you. I'm pretty. I'm dressed up right, no man would be ashamed of me. I'm I'm healthy and strong. I'm no lily handed lady that expects more than she's willing to give. I'm not asking for the center cut of your life. Go as you please and do as you please. Just say something nice to me now and then. That's all I ask. Just think about it until we get to Wicked. You're... You're something besides pretty. What does that mean? Mm. I'll tell you, Wicked Burn. When a cloud bursts and fresh, clean rain falls on a grove of rich green pine, it's mm, so nice. And now that same clean scent of pine is in new pine scented Lysol. Right. Now the one and only genuine Lysol brand disinfectant comes in a new pine scent. It disinfects, deodorizes, as nothing else does. Kills disease germs on contact. In laboratory tests, Lysol's anti-germ action kept working for seven full days. A bottle costs as little as 29 cents, and it's so easy to use. Just add new pine-scented Lysol to your suds when you clean in bathroom, kitchen, nursery, sick room. Use pine-scented Lysol because Lysol deep cleans. Make your home pine sweet and Lysol clean. You can still get regular Lysol, too. <laughs> How much longer? Another two hours. We ought to be in Wickenburg. What's the matter? There's somebody up ahead there. Hey, you there. Paladin, use the whip. There's no need. 
He isn't armed. Who is? Ooh. Hey, how about a ride to Wickenburg? What's the matter? Well, I've been ruffled, or whatever you call it. Just because one of their horses had thrown a shoe, they took mine right out of the traces. Four men? Yes. How'd you know? Who are you? Peter Keystone, hide and tell buyer from New York. For who? For my father. He owns the plant. I need a gun. Is there one in your rig there? Well, that's one on your hip, isn't it? It's empty. Have you got one or ammunition? What's going on? Those four asked me the same question. Those men you saw, the one who took your horse, they're after us. They'll kill me. Kill you? A pretty girl like you? Why? Have you got a gun? There's a repeating rifle under the seat and some shells to go with it. Well, just a minute now. I didn't say... I know you didn't. What are we going to do? Get down. Down the road. Coming up in cover. Yeah, I see them. They don't know we have a gun. What's going on? Just stay down. Just stay right here, both of you. But I... You stay with me, Mr. Keith. Yeah, stay with her. I'm going to work my way up towards them. Got you cut off. Ain't no sense in trying to fight us with one bullet. What are we waiting for? With that Derringer, he ain't got no range. Get him. He's got a rifle. Come out with your hands up. Sure. Sure, but don't shoot me. Don't shoot now. That's far enough. Now, get the rest of my money and throw it on the ground. Stand back. What are you going to do to me? You go get my wagon and drive it up here and load those wounded men on it. The wagon's gone. My... What? Her and that other fellow took off in it. All right, Mr. Goodfellow, hitch one of your horses onto his rig. It's better than nothing. I want to get to Wickenburg. Sweetest, you know, in New York, I never saw anyone just like you. I think... Oh. Hello. Mr. Keystone? Hello. Good afternoon. Mister, I, I didn't want to jump in that rig and run, but I was thinking of Sue here. Yeah. A gentleman always considers a lady first. The question is, what does a lady consider first? This is your fight, not his or mine. But I'm sure glad you came out all right. Well, what are you looking at me for? I ain't done nothing wrong. No, of course not. But this is Wickenburg. I promised you an answer to something here. You've got some kind of lies to spread. Go ahead. Men are always lying. True. Well, not you, but most of them. All I have for you, Miss Tyler, is an expression of gratitude. For the third and last time in our casual relationship... Thank you, Mr. Keystone. Oh, wait a minute. Don't go, Mr. Paladin. Let him go. He pretended to be such a gentleman. He was just a, a gunfighter, like I told you. I hardly know him. I, I saw through him right from the first. That's odd. Just now I have a feeling he's looking right through you. Well, look. Don't let him change our plans. You promised to take me to New York with you. Where are you going? Maybe we better talk some more about New York. Later. Well, what now, Paladin? 
You're very pretty, Miss Tyler. Goodbye. Mr. Paladin, welcome back to San Francisco. Thank you, hey boy. I think maybe you've gone a long time. You've not gone so long at all. No. Uh, tell me, did I get any messages? Oh, yes. So all kinds of messages. But any particular messages from a particular lady? Oh, you mean pretty lady with blonde hair who wants to marry you fast? Yes. <laughs> you want? No, of course I want. Where is it? Oh, no sensible. You run away from her. You run back to her. You run away again if I give you a message. Not a chance. Now, give me the message. Never mind. I'll give it to him myself. There. Satisfied? I don't know. Answer two questions first. Why did you go away? Because of you. Why did you come back? Because of you. You're a liar. Because of you. Um... Dinner? Hmm? I'll be ready at seven. Hmm. Call for me then? <laughs> Aye, very, very pretty. Yes, very pretty. And that's enough for now. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Gene Roddenberry and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Jack Edwards, Vic Perrin, Harry Bartell, Frank Gerstle, and Eve McVeigh. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. I promised I'd avoid a gunfight if possible. But it looks as though it isn't possible. I have one bullet left. You may draw when you're ready. Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875, the Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. <laughs> Go on, Mr. Paladin. Well, at 7 o'clock, we could have champagne in the lounge. Mm -hmm. At 8 o'clock, dinner at the Peacock, something special. Oh, I'm intrigued, Mr. Paladin. And, uh... Then? A uh, coach ride to Barnaby's for crepe Suzetta's only Barnaby prepares the crepe mm. And after that, a liqueur back here by the fire in the lounge. No. Then? What? Uh, no. Oh, hey, boy. Who is this? Uh, me, number one for Mr. Paladin. 
Dolly Larry, no champagne, no peacock, no creepy Suzettes, no liquors tonight. Wire come, you go. I know you already packed. Wire? Here. No, I... Bad news, Mr. Pellet. Ah, oh, dear lady, forgive me. Hey, boy, send an answer to Tom Carter, Abilene. Just say, have a gun, we'll travel. It's no surprise to anybody that the attractive and inexpensive new radios have proved popular. It's no surprise, it is, to anyone who listens to CBS radio. With so much in the way of music, comedy, drama, variety, and news coming your way every day on CBS radio, more than one radio around the house is more than a convenience. It's almost a necessity for anyone who has a daily routine. The man of the house wants to come home to an attractive home and an attractive wife. But household chores in themselves are rarely inspirational. The smart homemaker is one who refuses to let her regular responsibilities get her down. She gets her work done every day, but she gets her entertainment in, too. She has a radio in the kitchen as well as the living room. Chances are she has a portable radio as well to follow her from one task to another around the house. She knows why the inexpensive new radios are so popular. And what's more, she knows the value of CBS radio here you are. Your bag, your saddle, and your gear. This yeah. is your hotel right here. Now what's that? Oh, folks in the Wild West show hold up in town right now. <laughs> Most likely Ella West. Ella West, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the star attraction at Tomahawk Carter's Wild West show. It was kind of frisky at times. Uh, wouldn't go into the lobby by the front way if I was you. And you wouldn't? Not with Ella cutting up before breakfast. <laughs> she just might take it into her mind to shoot them buttons off in that fancy vest you're wearing. Well, I'll chance it. <laughs> well, just, uh, just friendly advice, brother. Sir, I'd like a room, please. Oh, uh, uh, what? A room. Oh. My name is Paladin. Oh, yeah, uh, well, just a minute. Uh, now, hold on, Ella. Firm fun, but enough. Oh! Yeah. 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 Ella! Look at them fancy pants and that fancy vest. You speaking to me? No one else, Nate. You don't need a room, boys. He needs a cage. I might even buy you a lemon squash later on, fancy pants. I'd prefer whiskey if I felt like drinking, which I don't. Say, you know who you're talking to? I do. I'm Ella West, and I can out-shoot, out-ride, and out-cuss any man here. I can out-drink you, I can out-chew you, and I can out-spit you. Possibly. Ella, Tracy Calvert. Tracy, where? Hi, Tracy. Now, you gonna let Ella take over your spot in the show? Huh? Morning, Ella. I didn't see you come in, Tracy. Why don't you answer Breed's question? Well, I... I just might take your spot. For two cents, I'd run you out of town, pony boy. Don't cut your price for me, Ella. Why, you... Break it up now, Bruce. Break it up. Drinks around Tomahawk Carter. Everybody. I want to talk to you, Ella. You too, Tracy. That squabbling's got to stop. <laughs> you find me in the bar. Come on, Breed. Well, sure thing, Ella. Come on. Yeah, what was it this time, Tracy? The same thing it always is, Mr. Carter. Well, wrap me in buffalo hide, paladin. <laughs> Hello, Tom. Hello. Oh, you're a sight. Well, you know, it's a real sight. Oh. Yes, sir. Tracy, that's Mr. Paladin. He knew me way back when I was making an honest living. <laughs> Tracy Calvert. I've seen you ride, Mr. Calvert. Laramie, Wyoming, 71, when you took the grand prize. I had a lucky day, Mr. Paladin. Well, we got power to make. Well, I'll run along, Mr. No. No, you stick here, Tracy. I got bad trouble, and I want you to handle it, pal. Save your money, Tom. I never saw a man you couldn't handle. It ain't a man. That little gal I want gentle. Tom, there's one wild thing man will never civilize. Woman. And if you mean that one, I'm afraid there'll be no pleasure in failing. 
That little gal in there happens to be Ella West. 24 years old, she's already more of a name than Calamity Jane, Cimarron, Rose, and Bell Star lumped together. I got her in my show, and I got damaged bills to prove it. And I'm going to lose my shirt even before I get my show together if something ain't done. You'll lose more when you get on the road. There's a million people want to see Ella West, Mr. Paladin. Darling of the frontier, heart of gold, yes, I've seen the write-up. She's fast with a gun, and she can ride like a Comanche. She has to be more than that. Ella West is a legend, Tom, a romantic illusion. Your audience will expect you to bring it to life. That's right. And instead, you'll produce a repugnant, grimy-faced, loud-mouthed little shrew. Well, I don't figure Ella's as bad as all that, Mr. Paladin. Oh, how long have you known her? She joined the show last month. Well, my question was, how long have you known her, Mr. Kelvin? If you don't mind, I'll look in on the stock. Tracy and Ella was raised in the same part of the country. Learned shooting and riding together. Let him tame her. He seems to have a personal interest. Now, doggone it, we're old... Tom, friends. Tom, you're talking about making a shell horse out of a wild, mean-tempered colt. Now, that takes more than taming. It means crushing its spirit, rebuilding it from the ground up. With a horse, the odds are ten to one for failure. Yeah, I guess I knew it wasn't any use all along. I could have made a fortune with her. That's why I want ten percent of the entire season's gate if I succeed. You ain't changed, have you? I hope that's the compliment. <laughs> it ain't never stealing to ask what you're worth. Of all baby filters, cigarettes, pet filters, best, pet filters, best. It makes good sense when you smoke and scent filters best. Of all other brands of cigarettes, can taste the best, can taste the best. A richer taste than all the rest, can filter best. What do you want? This here's Mr. Paladin, Ella. Oh, fancy pants. He come here to learn you some things. <laughs> you ain't gonna learn me nothing. Correct. My function is to teach. You will do the learning. I quit. Fair off, Tom. She just resigned. Wait just a blasted minute here. If anyone gets runned off, it's gonna be him. <laughs> Go along, Tom. I'll talk to you later. I'll be in the saloon. Now then, sit down, Miss West. Mind if I smoke? No. Go ahead. Try lighting that cigar now, fancy pants. That will be two deductions from your wages, the cost of the cigar and the bullet damage. You're kind of a cool one, fancy pants, but you ain't gonna make no lady out of me. First, you're not worth two cents to the show as a lady, and second, that would be impossible in the first place. Why, you... <laughs> you took my gun. It'll be less noisy that way. Now, sit down, please. Better. Although your audiences will expect you to be somewhat different from the average woman, they will expect certain fundamental manners. The essence of showmanship is to be different without being obnoxious. You're a lily-livered, fancy-talking dude. I'll run you out of town by morning. I believe you made the same ridiculous threat to Tracy Calvert. Him, too. Tracy said anything to you about me, I'll kill him. <laughs> There's a ring of honesty in that threat, Miss West. However, he said nothing. I was merely speculating. Are we ready? You got something to learn me. I mean, teach me, then get on with it. But keep your nose pulled in, dude. Incorrect. I gotta eat, don't I? You don't reach with a fork and spear a slice of bread. You pick it up with now, your hand. Now, just a minute. And you never speak with your mouth full. 
Now, it's one thing to act homespun. It's quite another. Reese! You wearing a gun, dude? It's quite another to create revulsion. I suggest you confine your idiosyncrasies to calling the food littles and complaining over the last I asked buffalo. you a question, dude. I heard you. Because if you ain't got a gun, you better get one. I'm going to teach you some manners. Drop it. Ella, you've been tied to this dude for two days. Now, you like it or something? I'm going along because there's money in it. You know an easier way, Breed? All right, Ella. Say the word when you need me. Breed seems to resent me almost as much as you do. I can handle Breed for you, dude. No need, Miss West. When the time comes, I'll handle him myself. Remember, just pretend I'm a newspaper reporter. Get on with it. Uh, another question, Miss. Tell us about your parents. My old man was a stinking drunk, and the old lady was worse. She was always... You are talking to reporters. Well, then let him make it up like they've been doing all along. <clears throat> Mention the homestead. Homestead? It was a stinking sow pen. You can ask Tracy Calvert. He... It was so bad you couldn't believe it. I'm sorry. You wouldn't feel so blasted up if you got rud up like that. You knew Tracy Calvert then? Oh, yeah, I knew him. We was kids then. His daddy had a nice spread of land. You should have seen Tracy's house. All painted inside and out with a fence around it. And Tracy's ma all starched up and nice. She gave me a draft once. My old lady traded it for some whiskey. No, I, Tracy did laugh if he'd ever seen me wearing it anyhow. I think I understand. What? About you and Tracy Calvert. Do you? Yeah, maybe you do it fast. You just kind of a strange one yourself. I didn't know real men came in fancy pants. Well, what I mean is, we ain't doing so bad, are we? I don't know. He's sort of like you. Everything I wasn't, Tracy wasn't. Everything I didn't have, he did. When he was real little, his mom let me stay one night. She come in and pulled the cover up and kissed me. I was 16 and he was 18 when they was going to move away. Maybe he wasn't growed up yet, but I was. You know, I was growed up plenty. I didn't ask Tracy to marry him. He'd just take me with him. I'd do anything if he would. He could cut me up into little pieces if he wanted to. Just take me. I never said the same thing since, but I'm saying it to you. I, I ain't what folks think. No man's never touched me. You take me with you when you go back to San Francisco. I wouldn't be afraid with you. Maybe if you... Kiss my cheek and say something nice. I don't want to be in no show, printed in no paper. I, I just want somebody to know I'm alive. Please. No. What's the matter? Look at yourself. You're still that grimy 16-year-old kid pretending she's a man. You don't compete with women because you're afraid to. Alice. Find a man who wants the smell of the stables and ask him to take you away. Breed wants me. Then you and Mr. Breed deserve each other. And he can have me. Just as soon as he kills you. Do you see speed laws and other regulations as restrictive? Or do you look upon them as protective? When a police officer writes a summons for traffic violations, do you see him as an enemy or a friend? Your life may depend on your attitude. Statistics clearly indicate that where laws are obeyed, deaths go down. It's no secret that emotional immaturity is the major factor in our accident rates. How else but childish can you describe the notion that breaking a traffic regulation is a way of getting away with something? What could be more infantile than believing one can prove his superiority by ignoring a stoplight? Unfortunately, too many drivers on the road subscribe to that kind of emotional outlook. The result is tragic. Almost 85% of all traffic accidents in America are caused by careless, childish driving. We hope you know our traffic laws and the people who enforce them are there to help save your life. He's a nasty one, Mr. Paladin. Come along if you like. Well, good afternoon, Ella. I heard you wanted to see me, Mr. Breeze. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I didn't recognize you first. Wearing them big boys' clothes. <laughs> You're carrying your play acting too far this time, Ella. Play acting? I've shot men for less. That's kid talking. We aren't kids anymore. Shut up, Tracy. You heard the lady, Tracy. Shut up and get out. Me and Fancy Pants gonna settle something. I've changed my mind, Breed. I don't want no killing. Uh-uh, honey, we made a bargain. You're gonna keep it all the way. Tracy, take her to one side. You, barkeep, pour five shots and set them up in the line. Yes, sir. Oh, see, I promised Tom Carter I'd avoid a gunfight if possible. <laughs> oh, you ain't got no choice, Fancy Pants. All poured? Yes, sir. Good. Now then, Mr. Breed, I have one bullet left. Please, draw whenever you're ready. Well, I... Are you going to draw? Well, I didn't... Well, if you aren't going to draw, I suggest that you find Tom Carter, hand in your resignation, and start traveling. Now. Lessons continue at 7, Miss West, in my room. Please be on time. Well. I got myself some female clothes. Cost more than Jenny and Buckerson. I took a bath. Well, Jenny. Tracy Calvert's right. If I ain't a woman, I ain't nothing. I can go if you want me to. You look very nice, Miss. Well, you don't have to say that. It happens to be true. You come off surprisingly womanly in a dress. Store sold me a lot of lashings and cross ropes to go underneath. It is and not I... considered good taste to discuss undergarments. I'm sorry. The only thing that threw me was my top notch is worse than platinum a cap on his tail. I still hate you. Kind of. Only you're smiling. Go ahead. I don't blame you. It comes in. I talk ignorant. And I guess a few yards of silk don't sound so like to me much. The wise man judges by the lady's smile. I think I felt better when you was swapping my knuckles and telling me not to steer my bread. Golly. That's the first nice thing you said to me. Dealing with a woman now. You're dealing with a shaky one. You just being kind to me. Woman needs kindness only when she has no virtues. I. I wouldn't want you to say anything out of pity. Pity isn't included in the course. Come in. Mr. Pallet and I were. Holy lovely jumping toes. So, Tracy. Why, Ella, you... Well, uh, I... Gosh. What's the matter, Tracy? Well, Ella, I've never seen you in... I mean, your hair, your eyes, Ella. You, you're a lady, Ella. Am I, Tracy? You sure are, and I'll kill the man who says you ain't. I'm sorry for what I said to you, Ella, about not being a lady. But doggone it, you've changed. She changed for you, Mr. Carlton. Huh? She'll tell you herself in time. But she'd like it very much if you just kept that silly look on your face and kept thinking of her as a lady. Oh, I will, Ella. I swear I will, honest. Oh, what'd I do wrong? Did, did I offend you? No, Tracy. No, dear, dear, dear. Now, Ella, don't cry. I... Mr. Paladin, what, what do I do now? Take your lady in your arms, Mr. Calvin, and never let her go. How are things in Abilene Town, Mr. Paladin? In Abilene Town, things are going smoothly. And uh, how are things here in San Francisco? Smoothly. Specifically, the young lady I never dined with, is she still registered here? Oh, yes. Ah. Uh, then will you please take her this note and tell her I'm back? I'd do it, but... Uh, 
Her husband no like. Her husband? Yeah. She got married two days ago. Honey. But uh, a Spanish dancer registered today. Very nice. Oh, oh, you catch him up for dinner, eh? The Spanish dancer? Oh, boy. Um, hey, boy, take that note up to the Spanish dancer with my compliments. Same note? <laughs> Same note. <laughs> No one we know of approves of wasting money. In spite of that, however, we Americans are often guilty of wasting our money by the uses we make of our government facilities. Take the operation of the post office, for example. Mostly out of habit, many offices and individuals post outgoing mail at the end of the day. In so doing, they leave post office employees with too little work to do at other times of the day. In addition, we forget to include zone numbers as part of the address. In both ways, we're slowing down the entire system for delivering mail and adding to the cost of our postal operation. The problem is simple enough to solve. Start solving it tomorrow. If you'll arrange to post letters and packages earlier in the day and include zone numbers on the return address as well as the outgoing address, you'll help our post office operate more efficiently for you and at less cost, too. Remember, for faster, more economical service, mail early in the day and include zone numbers. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hey Boy. Tonight's story was written by Gene Roddenberry and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Sam Edwards, Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dopkin, Lynn Allen, and Barney Phillips. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. Mister, you killed nine men. I never heard anyone say you made allowances for your opponent's ability with a gun. Have gun, will travel. Starring Mister John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco. 1875, the Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. Good morning, Mr. Paladin. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Paladin. Good morning, Mr. Davis. I'm going to be at the Pacific Union Club. I was wondering if there's any mail for oh, me. Clerk, a, a room, please. Uh, do you have a reservation? Uh, uh, no reservation. This trip came up suddenly. You have references? I'm Ned Alcorn, president of the City Bank in Placerville. Uh, uh, here are my credentials. Oh. oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Alcorn. If you will sign here. Excuse me, Mr. Pellet. Oh, uh, uh, wait a minute, clerk. Yes, sir? I uh, want you to take a good look at this picture. Mm. Manfred Holt wanted dead or alive, $2,000 reward. This man might show up here. 
Desperado here in San Francisco. Uh, may I see that, please? Oh, I beg your pardon? I'm sorry. My name is Paladin, Mr. Alcorn. I couldn't help overhearing. Oh. This Manfred Holt, wasn't he to be hanged last week in Placerville? Why, yes. He broke out of jail three days ago. Uh, killed two deputies. You think he's coming here? I think so, yes. He's killed nine men, and he'll come after me sooner or later. Why? Well, I was the chief witness against him at the trial. Oh, I see. His wife's living in a cabin up in Grass Valley. She had a son born while the trial was on. Holt swore in court that he'd see the infant and then come after me. Well, it'd probably be better for you if Holt was stopped in Grass Valley, wouldn't it? Of course. As it is, there's a sheriff and a couple of deputies chasing him up there for all the good it'll do. This makes the fourth time Holt's got away from Sheriff Ludlow. Oh, that sheriff's not too smart. I'm no bounty hunter, Mr. Alcorn. However, I am available for a fee. To do what? Here. My card. Have gun. Will travel. There's nothing funny about loneliness. Yet one of America's funniest guys, a man who lives by laughs, is haunted by loneliness. His name, Jerry Lewis. In the latest issue of Look Magazine, in an exclusive story entitled, Always in a Crowd, Always Alone, you'll find out exactly what Jerry Lewis is like. Look tells you why, when Jerry goes on stage, he carries nothing in his pockets except pictures of his family. And what happened when he forgot those pictures? Why does such a successful man drive himself so hard he ends up in the hospital? You'll learn in Look what Jerry thinks about, how he feels inside when he clowns for a nation of television viewers. How much time does Jerry spend with his four boys? What is his home like? And what was Patty's little speech that made such an impression on him about all the girls he'd meet on tour? For the intimate and often startling story of Jerry Lewis, don't miss the latest issue of Look Magazine, the issue with Jerry and Patty on the cover, at your newsstands now. Get Look today. It was a long ride from San Francisco to Grass Valley, and I had a lot of time to think about this outlaw, this Manfred Holt who had killed nine men. Nine men lying dead somewhere because of him. And his wife had just born him a child. It was a strange sort of cycle. Near noon of the second day, I rode out into a wide meadow and suddenly pulled up short. Three men were spread out along the side of a knoll, their rifles ready. They were working towards a thicket in the middle of the clearing. I dismounted and walked forward. Give it up, Holt. You don't have a chance. Can't blame Donnery Fool. Hey, Sheriff, look behind you. What? What are you doing here, mister? Now, I want to talk to you, Sheriff. I'm coming in. Where'd you come from? San Francisco. Are you Jake Ludlow? Maybe I am. That's Manfred Holt you've got boxed up over there. What do you know about all this? A man named Alcorn wants me to see that Holt has returned to Placerville. I was on my way to his wife's cabin. So was Holt when we caught up to him. Oh. Uh, is Holt alone? Yeah, just him. Got a saddle horse and a pack horse. Then you don't need any help. Not unless you want to save us some time and start digging his grave. You might surrender. You think I'd chance two days on the trail back to Placerville with Holt? He's already killed two of my deputies. He was tried and found guilty. They're going to hang him, aren't they? Hang later or shot now. What's the difference? Well, the difference between justice and hey, murder. Sir. He's coming out. I can see his horse. It's a pack horse. Stop him, Ed. Bring him down. That's fine shooting, just fine. You missed him. It was too late. He was fine. You crazy-eyed fool. Sheriff. Start closing in. I'll come in from this side. You think he's still in there? Better put that fancy gun in your hand. You might need it. Perhaps he was under the canvas on that pack horse. Who are you, mister? Name's Paladin. All right, Paladin. Keep your eyes open. Sheriff, he's gone. Ain't nobody in these trees. Looks like he got away from us again. And what did you do to stop him? Oh, I... There are his shells. He was firing from here. And he crossed over to here, where his horses were, and he, he climbed on one, the pack horse. He was under the canvas. That slippery, murdering devil. Gage, you follow his trail. Me and Abel hit straight for his cabin. One way or other, we'll find him. 
His saddle horse is over there. You want him? No, he just slow it up. Leave him be. Uh, Sheriff, I'll I'll meet you at the cabin. Look, Paladin, you cross Holt's trail. Just get out of the way. There's eleven men I know of tried to beat him on the draw. They're all wearing marble slab hats now. The sheriff and his partner Abe headed out for Holt's cabin, while the other deputy Gage followed the trail of the pack horse. When they were well on their way. I moved over towards the biggest cottonwood in the thicket. You can come down out of that tree now, Holt. There's no point in trying to shoot. You make too good a target against the sky. All right, I'm coming down. Why do you throw your gun down first? Here it is. All right, come on down. Yeah. How'd you know I was still here? You rode the pack horse under the tree and swung up a branch without touching the ground. How'd you get the horse to keep running? Slip a burr under the pack saddle? Sharp rock. Hate to do it to old Jenny, but she'll keep going till she shakes that rock loose. You knew all the time, huh? What's your name? Paladin. Why don't you tell Ludlow? He would have killed you. And you? What you gonna do? I'm taking you back to Placerville. To be hung at a county fair while they hawk buttons off of my shirt as souvenirs? Let's go. Man ought to be let die like a man at the hands of a man. What are you messing in this for, anyway? The reward? Alcorn hired me to see that you don't reach me. Alcorn? Hired your gun out of that quivering tub of gully mud. Can't even fight his own fight. Against you? Well, any man can't handle a gun. Got no business west of the Mississippi. All right, mount up. Look, Paladin, half a day's ride from here is my cabin. My wife and my boy are there. I got a present to give the boy. I see. If you let me get the cabin first, I'll go quiet with you to Placerville. No trouble. You got my word. I'm not begging, mister. I'm offering my word. The sheriff will be waiting at the cabin. I'm going to give my son his present. You've never seen your son? No. <laughs> He's only been around three weeks. Then you ought to see him before you go to Placerville. Let's go. This is the country, though. I tell you, Sierra's got every place beat. Good country. There's a narrow trail up ahead going up over that cliff and save some time. Okay, we'll take it. Wish my stomach had quit barking at me. Hungry? Be chewing on this horse, he'd hold still long enough. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, have some of this. Uh, jerky. I used to like jerky. Until I married up with Sarah, got used to Woman cooking. Yeah, it's pretty good. This here's the trail I mentioned. All right, you lead the way. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Yes, sir. A woman sure changes a man. It's too bad she didn't change her ways with a gun. We might have had more time together. Man has to be the way he is. I don't like somebody. I reach for a gun just natural the way you'd reach the scratching edge. Maybe. Watch your step, but there's tricky ground. You can't go around killing everybody you don't like. Does kind of sound like I got me some bad habits. Still, it don't seem right to hold a carnival and string me up. 
I got a son now. Can't you just see him going around saying my daddy got hung? How a man lives is more important than how he dies. When it's my finish, they'll be remembering most. Up ahead around that bend where it gets steep. Narrow and steep. You hug the wall. Okay. Now, if my boy could pay, my daddy stood up like a man in a gunfight. Got shot down like a man, working a gun. Now, that's something else again. Then I wish you'd hit pallet and take hold of that hole. I'll cinch his loose and saddle flip it. Pallet in? You hurt? No, I'm all right. I'll need help getting up. Drop me a rope. Thousand, you're down there on that ledge, and I'm up here. Come on, come on, man. Get a rope down you here. see how it is. You know what I got to do. You're taking me back to hang. Hurry up, Holt. This ledge won't hold me very I'm long. I'm real sorry, Paladin. I thought you never killed a man except with a gun. Holt. Holt. Grab this rope, Paladin. I got it. All right, yeah. mister. Come on up. I got it. Thanks. Uh, no thanks called for. Yeah. You didn't turn me over to Jake Ludlow when you could have, so you saved my life, man. You wouldn't have been down there if it wasn't. You went off of your trail so I could see my son. The way I see it now, we're quits. All right. Neither of us owes the other anything. Fair enough. You keep your eyes open from now on. That's my cabin there. Sheriff and Abe probably inside. Paladin, I've got to get in there. You will. What you got in mind? I'm going to wedge this. Oh, now. Oh. Wedge this pebble between the shoe and the hoof of my horse. What for? They're mine. Uh, now, you stay out of sight until Ludlow and his man ride out. All right. Come on, boy. Come on. Oh, you finally got here, huh, Paladin? Ah, uh, Sheriff, your, your man Gage caught up to Manfred Holt back near where you had him cornered this morning. He got him? No, no, he didn't. Oh, Gage did? He was still able to talk when I left him back at the clearing. Wouldn't hurt to get him to a doctor. Bad, huh? Well, there's nothing I could do for him. Abe? No, no, I'm not going nowhere. Not alone. Not with Holt out there someplace. All right, get our horses. We'll go together. Okay. What's the matter with your horse, Paladin? Ah, oh, he's gone lame. I can't ride this way. You sure can't. Looks like I'm stuck here. Well, you better hide in the woods till we get back. Mm. Here we are, Sheriff. All right. If uh, Holt gets here before we get back, use that gun. All right. <laughs> Time was when the sedan chair was considered the height of luxury. When you think of all the places you go and all the things you now do by radio, a sedan chair doesn't seem like much of a luxury at all. Tuned to a radio network like the CBS radio network, you can in a matter of moments travel to foreign capitals to learn what's happening to individuals or whole nations at a time. Because a network like CBS radio is made up of many stations, stations like the one you're listening to now, the smartest supper clubs from New York to San Francisco invite you to dance to the music of their big-name bands night after night. Because CBS Radio's vast network facilities extend in every direction, you can laugh with the funniest comedians in Hollywood or on Broadway. Then move on to a serious discussion of space-age problems, and all in the course of an evening. By all means, use that sedan chair if you have one. But if you want to go places fast, Take CBS Radio along. 
little cabin sat quiet and alone in the lush green valley. There was only a dust cloud over in the west to show where Ludlow and Abe were tracking the other deputy. I turned and motioned Holt to come in. Sure was some whopper you told Ludlow. Look, we won't have much time before they find Gage. You better give your son his present. Uh, Paladin, yes, you and me now reached a point where we stopped counting what we owe each other. Nancy? Sarah. So what's this I hear about you breathing, boy? Oh, <laughs> oh. oh no, Sarah. Don't, don't, don't be carrying on oh. so. You knew I'd be alone. I knew. I brought a friend, Sarah. Oh. Here's Mr. Paladin. Holt? Oh. Won't you come in? No, thank you. Uh, I'll stay out here. You two have a lot of talking to catch up oh, That's true. That's surely true. Come on now, Sarah. You... You show me what you've been up to. Sorry it was so long in there, Paladin. Takes a lot of talking for a woman to tell about bearing a child. Yeah, I guess it does. Good drinking water, ain't it? That's a good pump you got here, too. I got me a son, Paladin. Fine strap in, son. Did you give him his present? I sure did. I give him my name. Manfred Holt, Jr. I, uh, I see you picked up a present for yourself. Yeah, the gun. You know, it's funny, fella. A fella like me has just got to have one. Yeah. Let's get moving. Sheriff will be back any minute. I'm not going to Placerville with you. Yes, you are, Holt. Not for that crowd waiting there in Placerville. Not until I find Ned Alcorn, anyway. He hired me to see that you don't kill him. I never would feel right knowing he's walking the same earth I am. I'd see he had a gun. Now, we've talked about that, Holt. He's not very good with a gun. Too bad. If you went on, there'd be other men. Some of them pretty helpless that you wouldn't like. You'd have to kill them. A man just has to be what he is. I guess that holds for you, too. That's right. Well, I was hoping it wouldn't turn out this way, Holt. Ain't nothing you can do now to change. You won't ride back with me? No. Let's move away from the cabin. We've been told not to come out till everyone's gone, no matter what. She won't. All right. Here. Don't try nothing fancy, Paladin. Wing in the shoulder of the lack. man like me, you either kill or he kills you. I know. Of course, I'm figuring to beat you. I'm awful good. That pump. When the next drop of water falls... We both fire. Can you see it? Next drop. Yeah, I can see it. Building up, Holt. Yeah. It's coming. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Manfred. Sorry? Saving me from that... That Placerville circus? Manfred Jr., he, he don't like for his paw to get me. Manfred? Oh, Manfred. He wouldn't let me avoid it. He told me it would be like this. That you might do this for him. For him? He's bound to come. We've always known that. He shared his life only with many respected. So it was with his death. It was nearly dusk when I'd finished the grave and fixed a simple marker to go on it. An evening breeze was coming fresh from the high mountains. And in the half light, I could see Sarah, her son in her arms, standing by the cabin. Later, after I'd said goodbye and had ridden to the low hills that ringed the valley, I turned to look back again. Now there was no one in sight, but a trail of smoke came from the chimney, and I knew the woman was cooking the evening meal. And there was a wonderful peace in the meadowland.
Welcome home, Mr. Paladin. Thank you. Good to be back. Uh, while you were away, the San Francisco papers carried the full story of your killing Manfred Holt and your reward. Two thousand dollars. Oh, and yes, Mr. Alcorn left this envelope for you. Here you are. Oh, my fee. Yes, that's what I came back for. I'll be leaving in the morning, Mr. Davis. Leaving so soon? Something important? Very important. I have two envelopes I want to deliver to a young widow and her son in Grass Valley. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe. Is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. And stars John Daner as Paladin. With Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Sam Rolfe. And adapted for radio by Frank Michael. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dopkin, Frank Cady, Ralph Moody, Joseph Kearns, Gene Lansworth, and Sam Edwards. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. In all my life, I've only seen a dozen real killers. But I've seen 10,000 people who will sit back and let murder happen. Which is the greater evil? Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875, the Carlton Hotel, headquarters of the man called Paladin. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Paladin. Good afternoon, Mr. Sanford. Uh, pardon me. Yes? You dropped these by the desk. Oh, thank you very much. The glove that holds a lady's hand holds a world of prettiness. Really? Yes. My name is... I'm not interested in your name. I don't mm. wish to know it. I don't wish to know you. And if I did, this would not be the day, the hour, nor the place. I quite understand. Then if you'll kindly release my hand. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> of course. Again, thank you very much. Hmm. Oh, 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 pretty lady, not too impressed with Mr. Paladin. We are all entitled to mistakes, hey, boy. Oh, yes, but uh, how often? Uh, Seldom the time, the place, and the loved one all together. And husband make three. Huh. Telegram come for you. Oh. Answer? Yes. Wire back. Have gun. We'll travel. Crime, delinquency, threats of war. These are the subjects that dominate our news headlines these days. 
Not very pleasant subjects, are they? You may say that somebody ought to do something about cutting down on crime and delinquency and in promoting peace among nations, but that there's nothing you personally can do about it. That's where you're wrong. You can wage your own fight against crime and delinquency in your own family by taking the family to the church or synagogue of your faith this week. The inspiration and guidance you and they will receive from spiritual contact will strengthen moral background and faith. Regular attendance at religious services will help your family to work out its own problems and give them comfort in facing the tensions of our present-day life. Worshiping together brings your family closer together, too. And supporting your own religious institution provides funds to help those individuals and families who, unlike you, are unable to help themselves. Find the strength for your life. Worship together this week. In a way, I was sorry to leave San Francisco just as Christmas was coming on. The shop windows, already frosted, were filled with all those wonderful surprises which seemed to appear only at the Christmas season. And there was an excitement in the eyes of passers-by, young and old alike. In the air, there was the smell of cookies and cakes and candies. It was a good time to be in San Francisco. And yet the telegram from Colorado Territory left me little choice. It was a long trip and a cold one. And as I got closer to my destination, I heard more about the man named Beecher, the man who had hired me. I didn't like what I heard. Matt Beecher was a hard man, and he ran his cattle empire with an iron fist. It was the day before Christmas when I arrived at the Beecher Ranch. You got business here, cowboy? I was told I'd find Matthew Beecher here. You found him. I pay you $25 a month. This I'd like your work. This is my foreman, Tater. He'll sign you on. Howdy. Now, I didn't come here to hire on as a hand, Mr. Beecher. Oh, what did you come for, then? My name is Paladin. You, uh, you may remember this. Have gun, will travel. So? Well, you sent me a wire asking my help, something about your boy. As I understand it, he was carried off during the Sioux War six years ago. Well, you're too late, mister. I got him back just a few days ago, Mr. Paladin. Oh, well, I'm glad everything worked out. It has. Tater, ride him out to the stage trail. He's going to start back now. And Mr. Beecher, it's a long trip from San Francisco. I'll take travel expenses for my trouble. You'll get nothing. Put him off the ranch, Tater. Mr. Beecher? What? Does the boy speak any English? No, he don't. Why? Do you speak any Indian dialect? No. Well, don't you want to talk to your, your son? You speak the Pawnee dialect? Some. All right, Tater. Take him up to the main house. We'll talk about them expenses later. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Paladin. Maybe I'd better set you straight about something. What's that? Well, we ain't too sure the boy is Matt Beecher's son. Well, he seems sure enough. Yeah, well, Matt's sure of everything. He found the boy riding off from a small band of Pawnees three, four days ago. Matt just says, that's my boy, and takes him. Huh. What do you think, Tater? Well, he looks Indian to me. Of course, Robbie was only two when the Indians took him. That was when they killed Mrs. Beecher, too. And that nearly finished Matt off when they killed his wife. Is that you? Yep. Mr. Paladin, this here's my wife, Morty. Morty? Mr. Paladin. How's the boy today, Morty? Well, same as yesterday and the day before. Mm, is he sick? Well, not hardly. It's just we got to keep an eye on him every minute or he'll squirt away. <laughs> boy! Hey, boy! There he is, Mr. Paladin. About as wild as any animal that I've ever seen. Poor little thing. Well, what do you think? About eight years old, I should think. Mm, he'd be about right. He could be white. But some of that grime were scraped off him. It's hard to say. Hard to scrape it off, too. Well, what's he say? I haven't talked to him yet, Mr. Beecher. Well, talk to him. I'm paying you. Con la teshi. Kishoni, shoni kiburi, kiman. Kiwa. Salate shishoni kio. Tegate. His name is Chiwa. His father is Kalate, chief of the Pawnees. You listen to me, boy. I'm your daddy. I'd sell my own soul. I'd give it away before I'd lose you again. He don't understand you, Mr. Beecher. Well, he's got to feel something this strong, lingo or no lingo. Now, boy, you listen to me. He got, he got... What's the matter with him? 
He was afraid of you. Miss Beecher? Mr. Beecher? What do you want? Uh, it's Indians, Mr. Beecher. Indians. Ponies. Well, what Ponies. about them? Well, they're setting up camp. Where? They're really over on the East Range. So they finally come for the boy. All right, Tater. Yes, sir. Turn the men out. Make sure they all have rifles. Yes, sir. Now, wait a minute. What? Before you start shooting, why don't you find out for sure if this really is your boy? I told you before, I know he's my boy. You want to believe that, but you aren't sure. All right, Paladin, say it out. What are you asking for? Time to talk with those Pawnees. Well, you go talk then, but I'll tell you one thing for sure. No matter what lies they give you, that boy's mine. And if they try to come after him, there'll be the bloodiest massacre you ever seen. I rode out to the Pawnee camp knowing I had little time and less chance to stop a needless killing. There were squaws, braves, sitting, wandering. They were a hungry people and a lost people. At a tattered teepee, I found Kalete, chief of the Pawnees. Kalete was once man who greeted white man like brother. Now he wanders, hungry, forgotten like the gray wolf. I'm sorry. I... I wondered why Kalate was on this trail. White man steal children. Kalate will agree. A man may claim his own son. She was uh, my son. Is he white? She was uh, my son. I ask again, is he white? Skin is leather bag God made to hold the soul. Color of bag, no matter. He was traded from the Sioux. Our blood has mixed. But his is white. He is my son. I take him back. Kalate, if you take the boy, there'll be killing. This white man has many rifles. Can rifles kill what has been killed already? Look at my camp. When there is no game, my people starve. We are driven from land and winter is here. But we move no more. We stay here. Soon we take my son. Hello, Marty. Hello, Mr. Paladin. Well, what's going on inside there? Oh, everyone's tidying up clean. We're going to celebrate Christmas, Mr. Beecher, too. Mr. Beecher. Well, I know you won't believe it, but Tater did the trick, says to Mr. Beecher. Maybe the boy will remember Christmas. Ain't that a good one? Indian boy bringing us Christmas first time since Mr. Beecher lost his wife. Oh, got to find some more mess heat for decorating. Uh, we're going to have singing and eating and everything. Sounds fine, Morty. Well, Paladin... You see the chief? I talked to him. What did he say? He's your son. <laughs> I told you he was. You tell them engines to get their squaws and their tents off my property? No. Why not? You want them all killed? I want you to understand that Chief Kalate feels that the boy is his son, too, and he feels it very strongly. Now, if you talk to him, I'd be glad to act as interpreter. The only way I'll talk to him and his flea-bitten braves is with rifle fire. Listen, Beecher... Chief Kalate is the only father the boy has ever known. You kill him. How are you going to explain that to the boy? 
You speak Pawnee. You can explain it. You're wrong, Mr. Beecher. Yeah? I couldn't explain that in any language. Tater, I said rations, not all these fancy vittles. Well, it's Christmas, Mr. Beecher. Uh, now, look. Listen to me, all of you. Listen. If one calf wanders off tonight, we work double tomorrow, even if it is Christmas Day. All right, boys. The cider's sitting over there just awaiting. We can't get no stouter, so get to it. <laughs> Marty, what is it? The boy's gone. Gone? They come and took him. Why, Was they... it the Pawnee took him? Yes, sir. You knew about this, Paladin. I thought they'd try, but not so soon. Get your rifle. Now, just wait a minute. You're always reaching for a rifle. There's no need for rifles. No hurry. The Pawnees aren't going anywhere. They're tired of running. Preaching from a gunslinger. you just been aching to speak a piece. Well, speak it, Paladin. Talk don't mean nothing. Say anything you want. I'll still have the last say. Well, I'm far from being a preacher. But I do know something about killing. Now, these Indians, rightly or wrongly, believe the boy is theirs. A few people love children like the Pawnees. Now, the chief Kalati might have given up the boy. He knows a wealthy rancher could give the boy more than a starving Indian could, and they're starving. Properly treated, he still might give up the boy. On the other hand, these Pawnees can't run anymore. They're tired. But they would rather die here tonight and give up the child to force. It won't be hard to massacre them. They have no guns. All you have to do is stay out of arrow range. Those you only wound, well, someone will have to press a muzzle against their heads and pull a trigger. Now, this, this is no Christmas message. I haven't even suggested that to a starving man, food may carry more weight than rifles. As Mr. Beecher can tell you, sentiments like peace like goodwill, and love, and brotherhood, they're just words. Unless you already know what they mean. And if you don't, even if this were a chapel and I were a preacher, such words would, would do no good. Well, I ain't got much to say. We're going out to kill some engines. One engine in particular. Anybody that wants can stay here and draw his time. If you think you can find another job. And those who ain't going with me, speak up. Right now. Well, that's the story since the beginning, Mr. Paladin. The belly always wins out. My dear Watson, with all due respect to Sherlock Holmes, let us establish one fact clearly. There is nothing elementary about the shrewd deductions Eric Severide makes as he analyzes world affairs on CBS radio. As chief Washington correspondent for CBS News, Mr. Severide has opened to him almost every possible source of information. Experience has sharpened his perspective and given him an extraordinary working knowledge of the forces that make history. It's taught him to view each new development in terms of cause and effect. Each Monday through Friday night, as you'll join Eric Severide on most of these same stations, you'll find his news analysis remarkably free of snap judgments and predetermined conclusions. You'll discover, too, that his carefully considered appraisals of the news not only contain real clues as to what is going on in the world, but also they make the news as exciting as any Arthur Conan Doyle story. Beecher's men spilled out of the doorway of the main house to change clothes and get their rifles. I slipped out the back way and, taking the first horse I saw, headed for the Indian camp. Somehow, I had to keep Matt Beecher from starting a bloodbath he might not be able to stop. Even as Kalati and I talked, I knew there were horses moving in the darkness beyond the Indians' fires. Beecher's horses. You are wise men, my son, but we stay. A man without a gun still might run. No place to run. 
I have forgotten how to kill, but not how to die. Well, what good does it do the boy? Could he take another father after this? We got the camp surrounded. You want to explain that to the chief, Paladin? He knows it. You going to stand with them instead of with your own people? I ask you a question. I heard you. Hold your fire, boys. That's Morty. Women, what are they doing here? Mr. Paladin! Over here, Morty. We've got food and things for them Indians. There's 15 or 20 of us. Is it all right to come in there? <laughs> it's the most all right thing in the world, Morty. Come on. All right, ladies. Get the basket. You get it. What is? Call your squaws, Chief. Call your children. Call the boy. They're bringing food and gifts for your people. Shiva! Holange! Honemo! Well, they don't look very friendly, Mr. Paladin. I guess you don't look very friendly to them. Uh, what do we say? Oh, I'd suggest you try Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas? Uh, to Christmas, Mary. Morty, this is Kalata. He's the chief of the Pawnee. How do you do? Sir? Oh. I, um, we, oh, I, well, I only got one pair of hands. Here, you take this basket. Now, hold on there, Morty. I'm with you. Hello, Tater. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Paladin. <laughs> Come in, too, Mr. Paladin. Well, Pete. Now, what Beecher's doing is wrong, and I don't care if I do get fired. Well, look, Mr. Paladin, all the men are coming in. Why, Morty, you ain't rightly dressed for riding. Well, ladies, I have a time to change, but you sure don't have to. Oh, well, Chief, there'll be no bloodletting tonight. Uh, Christmas? That's right. They call it Christmas. It's a, it's a time of the year when people pretend there is no evil in the world. Yeah, I like. Uh, everybody likes. What about the boy, Chief? His name is Robbie Beecher. His skin is white. Chief? My boy. His boy, Chief. You can return the seed to the plant that bore it. He can't take it, nor can I, nor can anyone. I talk to boy. I'll talk to his father. Hold it, Paladin. Right there. He'll give you the boy, Beecher. What? You can take him home tonight. The chief is talking to him now, telling him that you're his father. I'll kill you, Paladin, if this is some kind of way of getting back at me. When do I get my boy? I haven't been paid yet. Thousand dollars cash. Well, I haven't got it with me. Well, when can you have it? Mara. And give it to the chief so he can buy some land for himself and his people. I'll do better than that. I'll give him some land. I feel like I should give something. It's a good feeling, isn't it? As a matter of fact, it is. Merry Christmas, Mr. Beecher. Merry Christmas, Mr. Paladin. Good afternoon, hey boy. When you come back? Last night, late. Oh, uh, excuse me. Oh, no. Wait, not her. You met her once, remember? I remember. She's always dropping her glove. Oh, too bad. I eat trouble. Oh, oh, oh. I beg your pardon. You dropped your glove. Oh, <laughs> oh so I did. Um, may I pick it up? You may. Thank you. Allow me to introduce myself? <laughs> well, please do. My name is Paladin. Uh, my name is Eugenie Meyer, Mr. Paladin. Oh. There's a princess named Eugenie. Uh, I, I'd rather hear about that glove that holds a lady's hand. Holds a world of prettiness? Yes. <laughs> I like that beginning better. Is there more? Oh, there's a great deal more, I assure you. But one question... Why the change of heart? Well, it's, um, uh, it's more a change of mind. The change of heart can come later. But why? 
You were very confident in your rejection the last time we met. Well, you were very confident of yourself, Mr. Paladin. Christmas seems to have uh, humbled you and me. Then we're both very fortunate. Now we can meet. <laughs> yes. Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe. Is produced and directed by Norman McDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Gene Roddenberry and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Jess Kirkpatrick, Roy Woods, Richard Beale, Anne Morrison, and Virginia Christine. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. You came to me with a torch and a gun. You call it righteousness. Call it by its right name. Murder. Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of the man called Paladin. Come in. Whoa, clean socks, Mr. Paladin. Mm -hmm. A clean socks for a trip. Very important. Oh, yes. Thank you. Hey, boy, just put them in the bag there. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 oh. Bottle of brandy in bag, too. It's for the trip. Very important. Oh, oh snake bite. Correct. Oh, no snakes in Nevada territory this time of year. Why not? Too cold. Ah, oh, maybe brandy for other purposes, like uh, drinking? <laughs> maybe. Or maybe to give lady named Cleo to uh, make warm? The lady named Cleo has hired me to do a job, that's all. Oh, sure. She wants me to find her husband. Oh, sure. And she's paying me very well. Oh, sure. Hey, boy. You know what you are? No, what I are? Auf den Knödel. Auf den Knödel? Yes. Now, carry this down to the lobby for me. I'm ready to leave the comforts of the Carlton Hotel and head for the wilds of Nevada. Auf den Knödel. <laughs> do you see speed laws and other regulations as restrictive, or do you look upon them as protective? When a police officer writes a summons for traffic violations... Do you see him as an enemy or a friend? Your life may depend on your attitude. Statistics clearly indicate that where laws are obeyed, deaths go down. It's no secret that emotional immaturity is the major factor in our accident rate. How else but childish can you describe the notion that breaking a traffic regulation is a way of getting away with something? What could be more infantile than believing one can prove his superiority by ignoring a stoplight. Unfortunately, too many drivers on the road subscribe to that kind of emotional outlook. 
the result is tragic. Almost 85% of all traffic accidents in America are caused by careless, childish driving. We hope you know our traffic laws and the people who enforce them are there to help save your life. The lady named Cleo, whom I had traveled over a thousand miles to help, turned out to be a fat shrew of 50. And her desperate need of me was to find a husband who had understandably tried to blot out his memory of her with drink. By the time I found him, he'd done pretty well. I figured they deserved each other, so I brought him back, memory and all. But I was left in the middle of the Nevada desert, miles from the railroad. I'd been riding for a full day when I heard a strange sound in the desert stillness. Or at least, a strange sound for that lonesome place. It was a baby's cry. And then I saw the wagon. It sat alone, without horses, forlorn in the sand. No sign of life, except the sound. I dismounted and walked toward the wagon. Get away from that wagon. Oh, I thought it was deserted. Move away, mister, while you still can. Is this all right? Now get on your horse and ride on. Are you alone here? It don't matter. A woman can't last out here by herself. Where's your man? Clear out, mister. What's that you've been digging? It don't concern you. Is it a grave? Who's it for? The baby and me. Oh, look, I don't know what this is all about, but won't you let me help you? You can't help us none. I can try. You ain't a doctor, are you? No, I'm not. Move on, then. What's wrong with the baby? Typhoid. Typhoid fever. Well, maybe I oh, could have... fast, mister. I'd just as soon shoot you dead as know you got a killing fever from us. But you just can't stay oh, out mister. here and... I ain't got the strength to dig another grave. Has a doctor seen your baby? No. Well, then you can't be sure it's typhoid. Mr. Mulrooney knows. Who? Mulrooney, the wagon master. He knows the symptoms. And he just cut you loose? Left you out here to die? He said it was either the baby and me or the whole wagon train. Are they sending help? What can they do? Well, there's a settlement less than a day's ride from here. We'll hitch my horse to the wagon. No. And they won't let us in. The wagon train's there by now. They'll know about the typhoid. They'll never let us in, not now. Uh, look, there's fresh water and food in my saddle bag, enough to hold you till I get back. Where are you going? To get help. Mister, you don't have to do this. Let's just say I want to. Pardon me, ma'am. Yes? They said at the store I'd find a doctor at this house. Yes, that's right. Well, my name is Paladin. I'd like to speak with the doctor, if I may. You are, Mr. Paladin. You're the doctor? Dr. Phyllis Zachary. Oh, well, how do you do? Didn't they tell you down at the store? Well, there were some looks. I guess people out here haven't got used to the idea of a woman doctor. Most of them won't even believe I am a doctor. Are you? My diploma's inside, if you care to look. Oh, well, no, no, I'm not the patient. Who is then? A woman and her baby. What's wrong with them? Well, the baby might have typhoid fever. Might have? Well, I'm not sure. Where are they? They're lying in a wagon a day's ride from here. I see. It's a long ride. You'll find my horse in the stable. By the time you have him saddled, I'll be ready to go. You're quite a woman. I'm a doctor, Mr. Paladin. Uh, wait a minute. Oh. Looks like a delegation, doesn't it? Yeah. Just a minute, you two. I got something to say. Yes, Mr. David? Mister, you didn't tell us those people had typhoid fever. No, I didn't. Who did? I did. My name's Jeremiah Mulrooney. Well, now, Mulrooney. You don't look like a murderer. What? 
You sentenced that woman and her baby to die when you left them out in the desert. They're diseased. You've done nothing to help them? Uh, look, mister, typhoid's a terrible thing. It, it's nothing to fool around with. We don't want it here. He that touches pitch shall be defiled forthwith. You've consorted with the disease. The fever is upon you, too. So, uh, you'd better make tracks, mister. Wait. Mr. Davis, he's not even sure it is typhoid. I'm sure. I saw it. You're not qualified to say. And who says she is? Are you going out there with this man, Mr. Thackeray? Well, of course, Mr. Davis. I'm a doctor. All right, that's up to you. But once you mix with a fever, you're not welcome back here. And don't try bringing those fever patients back here, either. If we have to bring them back, we will. Look, we got folks to protect, children of our own. And we'll shoot you down if we have to to keep them safe. They mean what they say, Mr. Paladin. So do I. You ready to go? I'm ready. I guess perhaps I wasn't used to the idea of a woman doctor myself, especially one as pretty as Phyllis Thackeray. She rode beside me through the desert all night, without rest, without complaint. Now it was just after sunrise. Maybe I should have brought something for saddle sores. <laughs> you want to rest? I want to get to that baby. Well... Shouldn't be long now. Good. You know, you should be on a velvet settee, wearing a hoop skirt and fluttering your eyelash over a fan. I tried that. It was too easy. <laughs> Is that why you studied medicine? Because it was hard? Maybe. Something like that. Wasn't it tough enough practicing back east? I guess I'm as much missionary as physician. I was the second woman to graduate from my medical school. Others came after me. It was difficult for all of us, but gradually we're becoming accepted as something better than freaks. <laughs> You're not accepted yet. You just got run out of town. Maybe I'm not the missionary I think I am. Or the doctor. Well, we'll see. There's the wagon up ahead. I don't see anybody. Neither do I. Come on. They're in there, all right. Both sleeping. You hope that's what it is. Is there anything I can do? Just help me up here. Right. And cross your fingers. Doctor, coffee's ready. Mm. Smells good. The food will be ready in a minute. Yeah. Here. Thanks. How are they? The mother's suffering from exhaustion, exposure, nerves, no sleep. The baby? Typhoid? Well, maybe. I don't know yet. Mulroney knows all the symptoms. So do I. High fever, red spots, delirium, and a coma that leads to the crisis. The baby has all of them. Still, it could be something else. But whatever it is, I can't do much for her in this wilderness. You want to take them back to town? Yes. You know what that means? Yes. It's necessary 
Medically? Yes. I'll hitch the horses to the wagon. Mr. Paladin. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come with me. I wouldn't miss it. Something about that Mulroney's face I didn't like. All right. Stop that wagon right there. Don't come no farther. Ooh. Ooh, no. Ooh. They have guns, Mr. Paladin. I'm going to try to talk some sense into their heads. Here, hold the reins. <clears throat> Stand right there. No closer. Dr. Thackeray has examined the woman and child. The woman has no signs of typhoid. Her child is diseased. The doctor isn't sure the baby has typhoid. I'm sure. That baby needs treatment. Now, Mr. Davis, you're a sensible man. Are you going to let Mulrooney sentence a woman and child to death? We'll bring what you need out here. But you ain't bringing them into town. They'll be completely isolated in the doctor's office. Pallet in there, sick, and we can't take the chance. We've got to protect us. They're not as sick as you people. Now, you may be able to keep them out of this settlement, but you'll carry your own sickness with you wherever you go. You'll die again every time you see a baby smile. We've got our own kids to think about. How do your children cry when they're sick? Any different from that baby? Suppose it was your child crying like that. Would you send it to the desert to die? Now, listen to me, all of you. I'm driving that wagon to the doctor's office, and don't you try to stop me. If you need a doctor, you know where she'll be. We won't let you do it, Paladin. We won't let you bring disease and pestilence into our midst. I'm afraid they'll use those guns, Mr. Paladin. Get back there with Mrs. Benson. Both of you lie flat. You gonna try it? Go on, get back. Come on! Come on! Hey, 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 Mr. Paladin, are you all right? Fine, fine, we're through. I'll have you in your office in another minute. CBS Radio will score another goal on New Year's Day as most of these same stations bring you our play-by-play broadcasts of the two year-end football classics the Orange Bowl, and Cotton Bowl games. From the Orange Bowl, CBS News sports experts will call the thrills in the Oklahoma-Syracuse contest. Syracuse will be making its second appearance at the Orange Bowl this year with an 8-1 to record. Sporting a 9-1 to record, Oklahoma will make its fourth appearance. There'll be plenty of excitement at the Cotton Bowl, too, where Texas Christian will be battling it out with the Air Force Academy. The Texans have made it with an 8-2 to two this year, and the Air Force Academy is the Cinderella team of college football with nine wins, no losses, and one tie to date. No matter where you go, no matter what else you're doing on New Year's Day, here's CBS Radio's on-the-spot broadcast of the Orange Bowl and Cotton Bowl games. All through that night... I sat on their porch and kept watch, seeing their torches, hearing the voice of Mulrooney haranguing the townspeople, working them up. But they didn't come. And inside, the doctor worked with her patients. It was after dawn when she came out to me. Still quiet? No, no. Mulrooney is still working on them like a witch doctor. There's breakfast inside. You'd better eat something. I'll stand guard for a while. Thanks. How's Mrs. Benson? She'll be all right after she gets some rest. And the baby? The fever broke last night. Oh, what does that mean? It isn't typhoid. Not typhoid? You sure? Yes. Well, how can you be certain? You've only been with her overnight. You still doubt me, don't you, Mr. Paladin? The symptoms are there. Symptoms can be ambiguous. Now get your breakfast. You need it. All right. Morning, Mr. Paladin. Well, Mrs. Benson. Nice to see you up and around. I wish I could tell you how much I appreciate Oh, no. No gratitude before breakfast. <laughs> Baby's better, huh? Yes, much better. 
Miss Benson, hmm? why does Mulroney hate you so much? Um, my husband died early on the trip. After a while, Mulroney wanted me to marry him. He said it was God's will to care for widows, and he was the chosen messenger. I wouldn't let him near me. Then the baby got sick. Come outside. What is it? They're coming. Look. I'll handle them. Go inside with Mrs. Benson. No, maybe I can help. You take care of your patients. You may have some new ones. I want to stay. All right, but stand back. That's far enough, Mulroney. This torch is the fire of truth and justice, Paladin. We'll burn away the seeds that Clara Benson has spread among us. We'll scourge the disease from our souls and bodies and purify these homes again. The only disease is in you, Mulroney. Mrs. Benson is well, and the baby is out of danger. Lies! In the very face of judgment. Mulroney, I'm giving you 15 seconds to drop that torch and call off those rifles. The flames of the just will vanish this scourge. Let the fires rage in the land of... You have 10 seconds. Wait! Listen, all of you. That baby never had typhoid fever. Don't believe her. I saw the child raging with fever, living with rice. That rice was measles. Three-day measles. You're lying. Three-day measles, Mr. Mulrooney. And you left them to die because of it. Mrs. Benson, bring the baby out. No, it's not true. You're trying to humiliate me, to belittle me. You'll see. All of you. The fever is down. The rash has faded. Her eyes are bright. There, look. Look at her, Mulrooney. You can kill people with hate, but not with three-day measles. <laughs> Mulrooney, three-day measles. <laughs> Stop! Stop it! You can't laugh at me! Stop! Paladin! Mulrooney, don't be a fool. I'm going to kill you, Paladin. I'm going to laugh at your grave. Let me see. There's no need. I think he's dead you shoot very straight. Mr. Paladin. What do you want? Mr. Paladin. Well, I, I, I guess we was wrong to listen to him. He, he seemed to have so much book learning. But he was just setting us against each other. I'm glad we woke up in time. Next time, you better wake up a little sooner. Dr. Thackeray, this town hasn't been too good for you. Maybe you'd like to come along with me. They can always use a good doctor in San Francisco. Oh, please, ma'am. I guess we ain't been very friendly, but we'll make it up to you. You'll forgive us instead. Well, Dr. Thackeray? Thanks, Mr. Paladin, for your offer. But there are too many of those velvet settees in San Francisco. I'll stay here where I'm needed. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Paladin. Good afternoon, hey boy. You get in late last night. Uh, sleep all day. Now up and feeling fine. I do indeed. Boy, you have good time with Lady Cleo. Lady Cleo. Lady will send for you, you know. Oh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'd forgotten about her. Oh, sure. Uh, I met a lady who was much more charming, a lady doctor. Oh, sure. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I've had a fine case of three-day measles. Oh, yeah, the three-day measles. Oh, sure. <laughs> it was true. Yeah. Oh, uh, you got dirty laundry. Uh, you put out tonight. Uh, to coin a phrase, hey, boy. Oh, Sure. Have gun. 
Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe. He is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Don Brinkley and adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin, Gene Bates, and Lou Krugman. Hugh Douglas speaking. Join us again next week for Have Gun, Will Travel. <laughs> <laughs>